Okay, so this is the third piece of our bundle. We already repaired the monitor and we already modded up the second unit, um, the 128D that uh, that was working. This one I'm told doesn't work. Um, let's see what happens when we turn it on. I was told the drive is bad or there was a drive problem and sure enough there is. The drive light is on and the drive is just constantly spinning and it's very squeaky. <laughs> Don't know if you can hear that. So we're going to take this apart and, um, and troubleshoot the drive. And I don't think it's the drive. It's probably the components. Um, a few of the chips um, would cause this if they're bad. But while we're at it, there's a lot of discoloration on the front of the chassis here. So what I think I'm going to do, um, I immediately thought, well, let's retro bright. Um, but I'm going to try leaving this in the sun for a couple of days. Um, it's been very sunny here in uh, in Oregon. You know, I've heard a lot about folks doing that and bringing back the color. So let's see if that works for us. This is a nice enough piece to experiment with. So stay tuned and let's see what happens there. Okay, so this area gets an immense amount of sun for the majority of the day. So we're going to leave this out here for a couple of days. I got the latch and I've got the front face of the chassis here. So we'll check on it in a day or two and see what happens. All right, stay tuned. So while the front face plate is out in the sun, hopefully waiting to have its color get a little bit lighter, back to kind of the normal color. Um, let's go ahead and see what we've got here as far as the drive not working. So I'm gonna go ahead, I've already plugged the monitor in. Let's go ahead and turn this thing on and see what we get on the screen. So the screen comes up just fine. The drive is still spinning. The screen doesn't look like it's locked, obviously. Okay, and we're getting a device not present. What we're going to do right now real quick is load a Diag cartridge. I don't have a harness hooked up, so what we're gonna see is a CIA error, um, some port errors and an interrupt error. So that's to be expected without the harness being hooked up. Okay. Okay. So it looks like everything is decently working. Um, unfortunately, I can, the drive has been running all this time and it's squeaking and it's kind of been disruptive, but everything seems to work fine. What you see here with U1, U4, U5, that's because the harness isn't hooked up um, to this. But the nice thing is um, the timers seem in sync, so I'm pretty confident the CIAs both are, are fine. Um, so. I don't see anything bad. I didn't see anything bad um, from that screen. So, um, so that's a good thing. So now let me show you what I spotted though, um, which is interesting. Okay, so here's one thing I noticed right away when I took the case off, is the sticker that says cut, which is nice that they did that because what's underneath the sticker is a trace that's been cut. Now this trace goes from this pad here to this pad here. And that trace there is the attention line. Okay, so what happens is when the computer, um, when you're trying to access a device, the computer sends an attention signal saying, hey, I'm gonna be pulling a device, everybody come to attention. <laughs> and then it'll pull the device number right after that. Well, if that trace is cut, it's not going to, receive any response from the attention signal, nothing's going to get attention, so to speak, and it's not going to be able to see the device. And so typically what people will do is they will cut that pad to disable the 1571, the internal 1571. Um, some dyad cartridges need that in order to properly give you the right feedback. They, the, the 1571 needs to be disabled. Um, some folks do it because they have external drives. They don't want the internal drive recognized at all. But what the interesting thing that I've noticed here is what they didn't do is when I used to cut this trace, 
I used to set the CIA pin side, um, this side, um, high. So the computer sends a low signal um, to the attention to, to activate it. But when you're not activating it, usually I want to keep this side high. And I don't see any 10K resistor setting this high. But what I'm going to do is, rather than just solder this and just connect this trace back um, to its default, I'm just going to, since the trace is already cut, I'm going to add a switch there. And what the switch is going to do is one side of the switch will short these two pads here, and that will be the default, um, just like your computer default, and then it'll, it should recognize a 1571 drive. The other side of the switch, when I flick it, is going to have a 10K resistor between this pad and this pad here, which will set this to high. Okay, and so in that respect, um, there's not going to be, the, the device isn't going to be recognized. Okay, so that's the one thing I see missing here is that 10K resistor. I don't know if that makes a difference, but that's the way I used to do it back in the day when I used to cut that trace there. So we're going to do that next. See if it solves this device constantly spinning or not and, um, and take it from there. Okay. Otherwise, everything here looks good. It's a clean board. Um, and if that doesn't work, then we'll start looking at chips like the 7406 or some of the other LS chips. All right. So stay tuned. Let's see what happens after I get that switch in. Okay. So let me show you what I've done here. Okay. Wired up a switch. Here's the pad that's, uh, that's broken. Uh, that's cut. So the yellow and this black wire here um, go to each side of that attention line. And then this red here goes to high. So uh, five volts, a five volt pad. Okay. So on the switch, basically, if I have the switch to the side that it's on right now, it basically shorts out this side of the attention line here with a 10k resistor that's on the left hand side there and that 10k resistor goes to a 5 volt pad okay so that'll set the line high if i flick the switch the other way and like this um, it'll short the yellow and the black and basically what it'll do is give that attention line continuity just like the default was okay so if we put it back the way it was earlier, remember how I showed you that we were getting a cursor and that we were able to type, and that's the way this is right here, right now. Let's go ahead and turn the computer on and see if we get the same, get the same thing. I don't have my hopes that the drive is going to stop spinning because just because the drive is disconnected from the attention line really doesn't mean it's going to make any change to that. But you never know. Okay, so as expected, this is what we had before because the attention line isn't, uh, isn't shorted, isn't connected, and we can type, okay, just like normal. And we should not see a device. It should give us device not present because the attention line isn't hooked up, okay? So now, I don't think we need to shut off the computer for this, but I can do it in any way just for safety's sakes. Um, I'm going to change the switch to short out the yellow and the black. Okay, so that's going to short that attention line back the way that it was, the default. Okay, so it should recognize the drive. Okay, so the drive is still spinning. So obviously there's still something wrong. But notice now I don't have a cursor. And that's actually a good thing <laughs> because that's a symptom. Um, so usually when that happens, your drive is spinning, the red, uh, the green LED is on, which, you know, it's on and you're not getting a cursor, then you're talking about maybe five or six chips that are suspect. Usually it's like the 74 LS 06 or uh, 7406, 74 LS 14. So that's what we're going to take a look at next. All right. So that's actually... A good thing, I guess, um, that now we can see the right symptom for the 
drive constantly spinning and the LED light being on. All right, so stay tuned. Let's troubleshoot this a little more. Before I get to troubleshooting the chips on this um, spinning drive thing, I wanted to show you a couple of other things that pretty much isolates the drive circuitry being the issue here. So let me turn this thing on. And as you already saw, and possibly here, the drive spinning and it goes with no cursor, okay? And that's having that um, ATN line, the attention line connected. Now, if I go into C64 mode, I was holding down the Commodore key. You can see I do get a cursor. And if I try to load, it'll get stuck there because there is something wrong with the drive. The other thing that isolates the drive circuitry also is if I'm in 128 mode and I hit the run, stop, restore, I do get the ready light, uh, the ready and the cursor and everything will operate as normal. Um, because doing that just go ahead and bypasses the 1571 temporarily. So you can see the same thing. It just hangs there trying to look for it. Okay. So those are just, that's just more evidence pointing towards the drive circuitry. And obviously the drive constantly spinning kind of tells you that anyways. But there's some other things that you can, can do um, and some other symptoms that you can uh, put under your belt here that point to certain things. I'm thinking that this is either in constant reset or more than likely the disk drive is holding up the uh, serial bus. And I usually look at the 7406 chip first. And if that's good, then I look at the um, 6522 next. And let me show you where those, those chips are here. My first suspect chip, though, is this guy right there, U112, that 7406 chip. That's usually the one that is I replace the most. Even the SX64, that's the first chip that I go to when I got uh, the disk drive on the SX64 constantly spinning with the light on. So I'm going to do that first here and check that one out. Um, the 6522 is underneath the board there, and... Um, that's my second suspect of this 7406 is good. Okay, so that's what we're going to attack first. So I'm going to take the disk drive off, and there's only three screws that hold it in place, and we'll go from there. All right, so stay tuned. Okay, so here we go. I haven't turned this thing on yet, but I think I found the problem um, with the drive. Again, remember when I first looked at this, I said either the 7406 or the 622 chips. Well, there are two VIA chips in here. Um, I unsoldered both and the 7406. Turns out the 7406 chip was fine, but this is one of the, uh, this is one of the, uh, 6522 VIA chips. Okay, put it in the tester here. Okay. And ready to go. And failed. So this 652, 6522, I should say, was bad. And it was one of the two. It was the bottom chip. I'll take the drive out so you can see which one I replaced. But I haven't turned this thing on yet. So I'm hoping that's the only problem, which typically, like I say, when you get the symptoms that we got on this, it's usually the 7406, maybe one of the 74 adjoining chips, um, or the 6522, one of the VIA's chips. So this is the drive light. Remember, it used to stay on all the time, along with the um, disk drive continually spinning. I have the switch set to normal mode, so it recognizes, it should recognize a drive. So what should happen is I should turn this thing on, the drive should start spinning, the light will go on, and then it'll go off in about three seconds, and I should get the cursor again, which I wasn't getting before. Okay, so here we go. Keep your fingers crossed. Here's the light. 
the LED light doing what it's doing. It's spinning three seconds. It's off and we get a cursor key. So it looks like that was the issue. 6522 via chip. And you saw the symptoms. So you can put that under your belt when you get those symptoms with the drive constantly spinning, the LED constantly on and no cursor, then chances are 60 is, is either the, the uh, 7406 or this via chip. Okay. So let me show you where that chip is found on here. Okay. So let's give me one quick second and I'll take that drive out. All right. Okay. So here's a 7406 chip. That's usually what goes bad. I also unsoldered this guy um, when I found that this one was good. Um, I shouldn't have bothered because, like I said earlier, it's either this is a 6522, um, but I did so anyways, and I found out to be good. And then you have one 6522 chip here, okay, and then you have another one down here. So I unsoldered both. Um, turned out this one was good. And of course, the second one that I unsoldered was the one that was bad. So replace that chip right there. And yeah, there you go. We got a working 128D, well, a fully functioning one anyways. So that's, uh, let me put this back together and we'll summarize and wrap this up. Okay, so one thing that I failed to do, um, you know, I, I, sh I should have kept that in mind is I didn't show how to take the motherboard out of the case. And one of the nicest things about the 128Ds is how easy it is to take apart because it's all modularized. So I'm going to work backwards and putting everything back so you can see where all the screws are and um, what you have to undo because you got to make sure you, you got a few screws on the side and you got some, you know, um, along the uh, joystick ports and all this other stuff. So the front of the case is facing that way. So first things first, let's put the motherboard back. Okay. And I'm just gonna line up the holes here. Okay. The uh, Drive LED goes through this hole here. And the power supply LED is going to go through that one. So before I forget, we're going to put this guy here um, just above the big chip case here. Okay. A uh, little stand is necessary for the power supply when we put the power supply back. So let's start putting all these screws along the side together. Okay. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven screws. They're all the same sizes. Um, that line around the outside of the case. Now, the uh, RGB port here has two screws that you needed to unscrew. Okay, and then on this side here, you have four screws along the joystick ports here that hold the, the joystick ports and the motherboard down to the case as well. Okay, there's also one screw here that goes on the side right here. So, turn this. So, this guy goes right in, right in there. Okay. All right, now we have the power supply. So first, I'm going to screw this guy. That was that standoff that we had. OK. 
put on when we started. So that's where this guy goes. Okay, then we have two screws, actually three screws that come in the back here. Okay, that hold the casing surrounding the power supply onto the chassis. And then we have one self-tapping screw that goes, that's the third screw that goes on the bottom that screws on to the left of the uh, RGB port. Okay, then we've got two screws here that go on the side of the power supply here. They go underneath the lip and that holds the power supply in place. Okay, that's all there is to that. Now, as far as putting the drive back, I still don't know what we're gonna do about this switch where I'm gonna, where I'm gonna mount it. So we'll figure that out later. Now, as far as the drive is concerned, there's only two screws that hold the drive in place. Here. So what we're gonna do is slide the wires in first, then slide the drive in. And then there's two holes here on the side that uh, that just need, get, need to get lined up for the screws. All right, so you got the drive lined up. Plug everything back in. The black goes on towards the back as far as the power supply goes. And then these, all three of these, when you plug them back in, there's a little, uh, a little lip. The lip faces this way. Okay. All right. We should probably tie wrap these little things here. So, and then the power sub, the power LED here goes through this hole here. Okay. Ooh, almost forgot. Don't forget to plug in the drive head. <laughs> All right. So that is how we put the case back together. So. Just do it in reverse to, you know, to get the motherboard out. All right. So there's that. So um, let's go see. It's nighttime right now. So I'm going to wrap this up tomorrow morning um, or tomorrow afternoon, I should say. Um, it's been three days now that the front of the chassis of the case has been out in the sun. Let's see what kind of color um, it has. I, I'm thinking I'll probably, st I haven't looked at it, to be honest with you, but I have just never really put much faith in this sun retro brighting, if you will. <laughs> um, so I, I'm thinking that I'm probably going to, my gut feeling is that I'm probably going to have to retro bright that, but we'll see. So I'm going to wrap this up tomorrow. Um, and yeah, there we go. Hope you're getting something out of this so far. All right. Stay tuned. Okay, so we're ready to put this thing back together, but I just wanted to point out a couple of more things really quick, especially if you're taking this apart for the first time. The LEDs here, um, both the drive and the power LED, are held on by a screw, okay? And it's, the LED slides into the little slot here and the screw holds the, the circuit board down, okay? So here's the issue though. When you're taking this apart, taking the screw out, um, isn't enough. That just will take the screw and, and allow the board to come out, but the whole, you, the whole assembly won't come out yet because the LED is also held on by this little tab in the back. So that little tab in the back, you're going to have to get like a small little tiny screwdriver and just gently push it backwards a little bit to let the LED kind of slide out 
while you're pulling it towards the, the top, pulling it this way. Um, the bottom line is you're trying to get the LED to slide over the little tab here in order to be pulled out. Okay, so just taking the screw out by itself isn't going to do it. Okay, you have to account for that little tab that's holding the LED in place as well. Hopefully the camera can pick that up. And then this whole piece is held in place. There are three tabs on the bottom that just kind of slide into these three um, recesses there. So once you slide the tabs in, this uh, just bends up or folds up. Um, and there's three screws. One, two, three. That um, one, two, three. That basically hold the front of the chassis in place. Okay. So also let's talk about um, the color. Okay. As I started this video, as you may recall, I put this, it, this was very yellowed. Well, it was almost orange, okay? Um, so I put it out in the sun and I held it out in the sun for five days and it actually worked. Um, the sun, five days and 90 degree heat um, all day for five days straight actually lightened the color. If I would have left it out in the sun maybe five or 10 more days, I think it probably would have gotten to this level but I don't have that kind of patience. So what I ended up doing is I ended up putting this, um, drowning it in a 50-50 solution of hydrogen peroxide and water and putting that in the sun for two hours. And then it just completely lightened everything up. So if you have the patience to wait, maybe, you know, two weeks out in the sun, um, I think it, it may be effective, at least in this plastic it was, but um, I don't have that kind of patience. So that's the result of that little experiment. All right. Oh, and in case you're wondering what happened with the switch that cuts off the attention trace line, I ended up 3D printing a small casing for it and mounted it behind the 128D, and that way I didn't have to drill any holes. So there you go. Okay, so let's wrap this video up. Let's turn this puppy on. Make sure that the light, the disk drive light goes on and then turns itself off after three seconds and that the disk drive stops spinning. And there we go, lights off. There's a drive spinning and boom, there we go. And we have a cursor. There we go. So in the end, what did we have here? We had a computer that had a constantly spinning drive with the LED constantly lit and no cursor. If um, you went to Commodore to the C64 mode, um, you would get a cursor. Um, even though you didn't get one in C128 mode, um, but your device wasn't found. So the telltale signs, a solid green light with a constantly spinning drive is usually either the 7406 chip or uh, one of the VIA chips, 6522. And in our case, it was a 6522. We also retrobrighted the front part of the case here, um, got some decent color um, on it. So as far as this is concerned, this will wrap up this third part of this three part bundle. And yeah, one word of caution before I sign off. Um, when I took this thing apart, since I had the motherboard uh, already at my disposal, I went ahead and socketed some of the main chips like the CIA chip and a couple of other support chips for the drive in case I ever have problems in the future. But just note, if you do that, be careful because the legs on the chips that are on the C or that are on the 128D here are not they they're not lengthy they're very short legs so if you socket them you, you may not you may have a challenge in socketing them and having them stay in the socket because the legs are so short so you'll have to replace those chips with the ones with longer legs if you're going to socket any of the chips on the C128D boards so there you go. So I think this will wrap it up. And like I always say, live for today, enjoy life. It's very short. And there you go. Peace out.